Hello friends. If you didn't make it to be with us on Sunday and this is how you're connecting, I'm sure glad you're here. And I, I just pray that you can feel and know the peace of Christ wherever you're at with you today as you're connecting with us in this space, in, in this way. The Parable of the Sower While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to see Jesus from town after town, Jesus told this parable. He said a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some of it fell along the path. It was trampled on. The birds ate it up. Some of it fell on the rocky ground. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they didn't have any root. They didn't have any moisture. Other seeds fell among the thorns. It grew up with the seed and the thorns choked the plants so they didn't bear any grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, it grew, it produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, even a hundred times more than what was sown. When Jesus said this, he called out, Whoever has ears, let them hear. And Jesus, we pray that we would be those who do have ears, who do hear what it is that you're saying in our life. Amen. Nick. Nick was 11 years old. He shut his bedroom door, turned on the stereo. Out in the kitchen, his parents were arguing, fighting, shouting again. And it was nothing new. He hoped it wouldn't escalate into anything more this time. He remembered that time when a vase got shattered, that other time when a table was broken. Every time they started fighting, Nick ran away. He disappeared into his bedroom, kept his head down. As the night dragged on, the fighting only escalated. Nick was getting hungry. Now, normally, Nick would just sneak down into the kitchen and find something to eat. But that's where his parents were arguing, fighting, shouting. So finally he thought, well, maybe, maybe I can just sneak in there. Maybe they won't notice me. I'll slip in there and I'll find, I'll grab something and I'll get out. So he went down to the kitchen and immediately his mom shouted at him, what do you think you're doing in here? Nick said, I, I, I was just getting hungry. His mom screamed, what do you think I look like? A vending machine? His dad picked up a shoe that was on the floor and threw it at him. Get out of here. It hit him in the forehead. It gave him a good-sized welt and an even bigger welt on his heart. Nick ran back to his room, bawling. He put his head under his pillow, and he sobbed, and he sobbed, and he sobbed, until he fell asleep, hungry. And that was the day that Nick decided that it was just better to keep the peace, better to push his needs down, Push them away. Swallow your pain. He swallowed his sadness, swallowed his anger. There was no place for it. There was no room for it in this family that already had way too much pain and sadness and anger. And so that was how Nick grew up, with his parents screaming and shouting often. Somehow they had an unusual capacity for conflict where many people would leave they stayed. They fought. And when they weren't in their fighting mode, it always felt like their next fight was imminent, which meant that Nick was careful not to ruffle their feathers, careful to not have an opinion, not complain. He tried to stay out of the way. Just, just tune it out. Don't make waves. He pushed away his needs, his hunger, his schedule, his sadness, his pain. 
When Nick graduated, he moved out. He got a job as a sales associate at Target, and he shared a house with two other guys, his roommates, Anthony and Josiah. Nick didn't know what he wanted to do with his life, but he did know that he was glad to not be in a house with constant fighting. But Nick was at his new house less than any of the other guys because he, he couldn't say no to his boss. He just couldn't. Every time that his, his boss would ask him, hey, can you work on Saturday? Uh, hey, I need you to work a double shift. He'd say, oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. It was the only way he knew. It was like this world had no room for his needs, no room for his schedule, his pain. Nick was so passive that it seemed like everyone just walked all over him. There was no room for him to consider his life, his thoughts, his opinions, his desires, because he was constantly trying to dodge a critical comment from this angle, uh, a reaction from this angle, a judgment from here, anger from here. He was, he was trying to dodge all the shoes that might be thrown at him. And so this was Nick, pushing grocery carts out in the Target parking lot, checking groceries, helping customers, paying his bills, taking out the garbage for his roommates, doing the dirty dishes that they left in the sink, getting home from a late shift, going to bed, returning in the morning, paying his roommates' bills when they forgot. On the one hand, you might have said Nick was a model citizen, a model person. I mean, everything that he did was for somebody else. He was a master people pleaser. He never said a cross word to anyone. He, he was kind to everyone. He'd bend over backwards for anyone who asked him to do anything. But on the other hand, Nick's heart was compressed. Just, it was, it was suffocated, asphyxiated, numb, just walked all over. He, he didn't know what he thought. He didn't know what he felt. He didn't know what he wanted. He, Nick didn't know Nick because he never felt like the world had any room for Nick. When Nick was Nick, back when he was 11, the world screamed at him. The world threw shoes at him. One day, Nick was out in the Target parking lot. He was pushing a, a great big stack of grocery carts inside and a careless driver was whipping around in the parking lot trying to find a place to swing in a place to park and he was going too fast and he did not see Nick and it happened faster than than anyone could have imagined the front bumper of that car hit Nick and it hit the carts and Nick's body was thrown across the way into a Dodge Durango. Nick heard his body smack. He felt an explosion of pain, a, sh a sharp, like stabbing pain in his chest. He was incredibly hot and then incredibly cold and then unconscious all that fast. When Nick woke up, he was in a hospital room in a hospital bed. The nurse told him that he had broken several ribs. He had a collapsed lung that required surgery. He had a broken femur that required pins, multiple lacerations. The nurse said, you're looking at a long recovery, and you're going to need someone that can take care of you. You're going to need a caregiver for a while. Nick was at a loss. It wasn't that his roommates wouldn't help. He thought they might. He certainly didn't want to go home with his parents, uh, but he had spent so many years with people walking all over him. He, he just could hardly remember how to connect with what he needed, much less how to tell someone what he needed. That wasn't a skill that he had. While he laid in the hospital bed, the chaplain came in to see him. 
And the chaplain asked him a few questions about what's this experience mean for you? Uh, what's this experience making you feel? He knew Nick had been hit by a careless driver. But Nick was unable to say what it meant for him. He, he was unable to say how he felt. Those kinds of conversations, all that stuff was compressed, backed up. The, the last time Nick had ever cried about anything was that night when he was 11 years old. That night when his dad threw the shoe at him. The chaplain looked Nick in the eye and the chaplain said, Nick, your pain matters to God and what you need matters to God and what you feel matters to God. And the path to healing involves you recognizing, naming your pain, naming your feelings, and naming what you need. So it's okay to name those things and it's okay to ask for help. And the chaplain prayed a short blessing for Nick and, and he walked out of the room. And Nick lay there in the hospital bed and he was totally spellbound. No one had ever said anything like that to him. Like, sure, maybe he had heard that as a generalization that people spouted off here and there, but no one had ever said that kind of a thing to him. It was a God seed. It was a God thought. The first one that Nick had ever encountered, he closed his eyes in the hospital bed and he tried to replay what the chaplain had just said. He tried to remember it. Those words, they had felt so peaceful to him. He tried to find a place for them in his heart that was so numb and compressed, suffocated. Down the hallway, he heard his parents' voices. They were coming. They were always so loud, he could hear them coming. And they blew into his room with a storm of questions and, and anger towards whoever had hit him with their car. Nick, if you don't press charges, so help me. And in an instant, that peace evaporated. The chaplain's words just disappeared. They were gone, bruised and broken, hooked up to IVs and medicine bags, all kinds of pain meds. There was Nick in the bed and his brain now being forced, going into high gear, just trying to settle his parents down in the room, trying to tell them, I'm okay. It's going to be okay. Everything's fine. I don't need anything. He, he was still trying to stay out of the way, still burying his needs, his sadness, his anger, his pain. For just a moment, those God thoughts, that God seed, had felt like it could open up a new world, new possibilities. But just that fast, they were gone. The God thoughts were gone. And Nick was getting walked on again. Nick lay in that hospital bed for an entire week. After a few days, his roommates came and visited him, Anthony and Josiah. And as they were leaving, a social worker caught them both out in the hallway. She wanted to have a conversation. She said, guys, you're, you're Nick's roommates, right? Yeah, yeah, we are. So when Nick goes home, he's going to need to rest for a while. And he's going to need someone who can help him and care for him. Uh, like fix some meals, bring him water throughout the day. Uh, at the beginning, probably help him at least at some level do some dressing, like just to get the, the shirt on or some of those kinds of things. Uh, someone to go to the pharmacy for him. He's going to need someone that can kind of be on hand. Do you think between the two of you, you could handle that? Well, Josiah was completely silent. Things for him at work right now were totally crazy. Uh, he, he just had no idea how he could do that. 
And it was an awkward question. So Anthony piped up. He said, hey, you know, it sounds cool. I, we'll think about it and we'll get back to you. And with that, they walked down the hallway. And by the time Anthony made it out to his car, he was thinking about something else. Anthony, Nick's roommate, he was a high energy guy. Like he was always thinking about 10 things at once. And he always had a few things on the back burner, you know, option A, B, C. And if this doesn't work, I'll do that. And he was fast talking and fast paced. And always excited about the next thing, the new possibility. He was adventurous and spontaneous, and he wanted to do everything and try everything. Rock climbing, skateboarding, learn the guitar, find the best new restaurant, the next band, the next career, the next movie, the next girlfriend, the next place to visit. And so Anthony drove away from the hospital, and he was on his way to a new restaurant. Meet up with his current girlfriend, Sarah. So they sat down at the new restaurant together. And as the conversation went, eventually Anthony told Sarah about Nick. And this guy, he got hit in the Target parking lot. Can you believe it? Well, Sarah had met Nick. And he seemed like one of the nicest guys she'd ever met. And she started asking questions. Well, who's going to take care of Nick? And eventually, eventually Anthony admitted. He's like, well, they asked me to do it. Well, are you going to do it? I don't know. It, Anthony just, he said, it, it sounds so boring. So Sarah says, she says, Anthony, I, I just listened to this talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. And it was really powerful. Uh, you should really listen to it. Like this, this guy talks about how it changes people and how it brings them closer to God and stuff. And I, yeah, I really liked it. Like, Anthony, what if you got ran over in the parking lot? What would you want to happen? She said, here, I'm gonna send it to you. Take a listen to it sometime. So Anthony listened to the talk on his drive home and by the time he made it home he'd made it through half the talk and that was all he cared to listen to because he had already decided that eh, you know taking care of Nick that might be his next cool thing you know he'd never done anything like that this God stuff was new for Sarah it was new for Anthony for sure he would never delved into anything spiritual at all and so it was kind of cool to think about this, this God man, Jesus guy, who was telling people to love their neighbor as themselves. Like, it, you know, it could be cool to feel closer to God if, if there was a God. And so Anthony said, you know, I, I, I can try that. So he called the hospital. He said, hey, I, I'll take care of Nick. And he even texted Sarah and said, hey, I think this God stuff's kind of cool. We should check it out. So, Nick came home with Anthony. Nick was an easy enough patient. You know, he hardly asked for anything. He slept for hours every day. Sarah knew that Anthony was sitting at the house with nothing to do, just watching over Nick. And so she kept sending him some other YouTube talks from this church that she had just started to attend. These, these YouTube talks, it's like they were just packed with God thoughts, little, little God seeds. And Anthony, he didn't have anything better to do, so he just watched them, one after the other after the other. But by the third day, Anthony was going completely stir-crazy. <laughs> he told Sarah, he said, I am so bored. She said, well, didn't you watch all those talks that I sent you? Well, yeah, I, I did. And they were, they were interesting, but, but, but Anthony was stuck in the present moment and he had spent his entire life distracting himself with the next thing. That was the way he lived. Uh, and now the only next thing was, what do I have to do next to take care of Nick? And so 
there he was in the house, just sitting alone with his thoughts and sitting alone with these YouTube talks. And it was bringing up all kinds of feelings, all kinds of thoughts for Anthony that he had spent years just trying to avoid. Emptiness and frustration and pain and fear and regrets and disappointment. By day five, Anthony could not take any more of it. It was torture just sitting alone with Nick. He called Sarah and he, he said, I'm done. I am done with Nick. I'm done with this love your neighbor as yourself stuff. Like, honestly, Sarah, I, he said, sitting with Nick is so depressing. You said it would change me, but it's just depressing. Like this guy has absolutely zero opinions and mostly he just sleeps and sitting here by myself and watching these videos, it just makes me think about all these dark thoughts and painful thoughts. Sarah says, well, who's, who's going to take care of Nick? I don't know, Sarah. But all I know is I'm going to a kite surfing clinic this weekend. And it's going to be awesome. And you should come with me. <laughs> you want to come? Well, Sarah said, no. Like, someone has to take care of Nick until he's better. If you won't do it, I will. It was completely uncharacteristic, completely unlike Sarah to do something like this. For her age, she was highly accomplished. She was one of the best investment bankers at her firm. Normally, the only thing that she was thinking about was how to be the best, how to dazzle her clients, how to be the most competitive. She never called in. She never took vacation. That was how you fell behind in investment banking. And so this was completely unlike her. But it was this Jesus stuff. It had her thinking down other roads. You know, she'd spent her entire life trying to act like she was the best, trying to act like she was perfect. But now she was learning about God's mercy and God's grace and confession, that it was actually healing to face your deficiencies, your mistakes, your regrets, your sins, to admit them to yourself, to admit them to God. And then God accepted you and forgave you and loved you. And your value wasn't even connected to your success. And, and all of that felt incredibly freeing to her. And somehow it made her want to think outside of herself. And so Sarah called her work and she took the next few days off. She spent them taking care of Nick. During those days of caring for Nick, Sarah told Nick about her budding interest in Jesus. And they watched more of these talks that Sarah had been watching from her church. And as Nick heard this story of this Jesus guy getting murdered, like torturously murdered on a cross, Nick was spellbound by Jesus' ability to pray for his murderer's forgiveness and then at the same time to name his own needs. Like to say, as he's being tortured and dying, Father, forgive them. And to say, I'm thirsty. Like, how, how does someone say both of those things while they're being tortured to death? Ever since the day that Nick's dad had thrown that shoe at him when he was 11, Nick had never done either of those things. He'd stop naming what he needed. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. He, he didn't do that anymore. And he knew that buried somewhere way deep down, he was intensely angry with his parents. He just knew it. He'd never forgiven them. So this, this Jesus guy was opening up a new possibility. What if forgiveness was possible? Like somehow this whole experience of being a patient Laying, being forced to just lay down for a few weeks and ask 
for help, name his needs. At some level, it had opened up space in Nick's heart. For the first time, or for a long time, it was like these these God thoughts, these God seeds were finding a place, and they were bringing this otherworldly power and accomplishing something inside of Nick that he would have never imagined possible. Somehow these God seeds had found room, space to grow. Nick began reading the Gospels. For the first time ever, he tried praying. He found that he was accessing feelings that he had been pushing down, compressing for years and years and years. He found it coming out in weird, surprising ways. He found himself bawling in the shower like a little baby, so angry, so sad that he could scream if if Sarah wasn't in the house. But of course, he was mindful of that and kept it quiet. He could feel that he was changing. And it wasn't just that his leg was healing or his ribs were healing. It was something much deeper. Now, Sarah had thought this experience of caring for Nick was going to be fulfilling. And it was. But her phone was ringing off the hook while she took off work. She had clients, client after client, who wanted to meet right now, today. Uh, They needed an answer right now. Her boss was calling her and telling her that her name had come up for a major promotion. She could receive a huge raise if she got that promotion. She'd be able to pay off her mortgage, her school loans. If she got the promotion, she could afford the house, the life, the car, the vacations, everything that she'd ever dreamed of. But she wasn't going to get that promotion sitting around at Nick's house and going to church on the weekends. She was going to have to start pulling 70 and 80 hour weeks. She was going to have to finish proving herself as a competitive investment banker. Sarah could just imagine herself living her dream life. And so Sarah apologetically told Nick, I think I'm going to have to go back to work, Nick. Nick was on the mend, and he said, I I think I'll be able to manage. I can make it. For Sarah, the God thoughts had been so beautiful. She genuinely loved every moment of it. Every moment that she had spent learning about Jesus, attending her church, uh, but now... It's time to put all that aside. It was time to put her nose to the grind. She was going to have to work every weekend. Go get that dream job. Go get that dream life. There was no longer any space for the God thoughts. When Nick was well enough to go back to work, he didn't only go back to work. He started going to that church that Sarah had been attending. And he just could not get enough of Jesus. He just couldn't. It was like his heart was opening up. Uh, Learning about the Psalms felt like a game changer to him as well. These prayers, these ancient prayers that expressed the whole range of human emotions to God, that felt like a game changer. He'd never been good at expressing any range of human emotions. His emotions... The more time Nick spent reading the Gospels and with his new church, the more convinced he became of something that he needed to do. It was like now that these God thoughts had room in his heart, he was surprised at how much love he actually had, how much courage he had to say no to some things so that he could say yes to other things, really important things. He was surprised at how overjoyed he was in just being Nick. Uh, Like he realized there's more Nick inside of me than I thought there was. And so he did the thing that he had been feeling like he needed to do. It was his parents' anniversary. He knew they were probably going to fight, but he invited them over anyways. 
He invited them over. He said, I want to fix you guys a meal. He knew they both liked ribeye, ribeye steaks, and so he fixed them. And he knew his mom liked cheesecake, and so he made it. They came over and, of course, squabbled throughout the meal, but they made it through somehow. And somehow Nick felt a different kind of peace as they made it through the meal. He kept thinking about those words of Jesus, my peace I give you. As Nick served his parents the dessert, the cheesecake, he pulled out two gift pa- two wrapped up packages that he had sitting behind a little cupboard and he pulled them out. He handed one to each of his parents, his mom and his dad. He said, open them. And so they, they start pulling off wrapping paper and opening them and Inside of each package was a box, a pair of shoes, a pair of shoes that Nick had specifically selected for each of them. And they they stared at the shoes kind of dumbfounded. Nick said, I'm going to tell you something really important. He said, I don't want you to blame one another right now. And I don't want you to fight about what I'm about to say. So I just want you to hear me out. One night, when I was 11 years old, you two were fighting out in the kitchen. I don't know if you remember it or not. I came into the kitchen. I was hungry. Mom, you shouted at me. Dad, you shouted and told me to get out of there. And you hit me with a shoe. He threw a shoe at me, and I ran to my room crying. I went to bed hungry, and something changed in me. I That night, it's like I spent the rest of my life trying to tell myself that being hungry doesn't matter, that my needs and my thoughts and my feelings just don't matter. And I tried to swallow all of my sadness and my pain and everything I felt about how much you guys fought. And I tried to keep everyone happy. And I bent over backwards for everyone. And everyone walked all over me. And then the accident happened. You guys remember that when I got hit in Target? And I met Jesus. And I met a community of people. They told me that I'm supposed to become exactly who God created me to be. And I learned that my feelings and my pain and my sadness and my thoughts and my opinions, everything about me matters. And I actually started to get in touch with my feelings for the first time since I was 11. And at first I was so angry with you two that I really, I didn't want to see you ever again. Uh, You wanted me to be mad at the target guy. I, I wasn't mad at him, but I was mad at you too. But I kept learning about the healing power of forgiveness. Uh, I learned about how God in Jesus forgives the entire world. That God forgives me. And I, I came to realize that I need to forgive you guys. And so these shoes that I'm giving you, they're my forgiveness shoes. And this meal that you just ate, it's my forgiveness meal that I'm giving to you. I I forgive you, Dad, for throwing those shoes at me when I was 11, that shoe. And I forgive you, Mom, for shouting at me because I was hungry the way that you made me feel like I had to spend my life dodging shoes and like my hunger didn't matter. I forgive you. And I want a good life for you. I don't want you guys to suffer. I I don't want you to hate one another. I don't want you to hate yourselves for this. I love you and, and I want you in my life. And I don't know what the future holds But for the first time ever, 
I feel like I'm beginning to have this sense of purpose and, and meaning in my life. And I'm starting to develop real hopes and dreams. It's something that I never had. Well, Nick's parents, they sat there just speechless. Big tears started to run down out of Nick's mom's eyes. And she leaned in and she hugged Nick. It, it was just too much for her. She didn't have any words, but she wanted to hug him. Nick's dad, he couldn't bring himself to even get in touch with any feelings. He just sat there. He just stared at the floor. He, he couldn't do anything else. And so they, they wrapped up the rest of the evening. And as Nick's parents left that night, Nick surprised himself. He, he broke into laughter at how light he felt and, and how at peace he felt. He never imagined that he could ever feel this way, ever, in a million years. He couldn't believe the difference that these small God seeds had made once they really found room in his heart. He felt hopeful for what the future held those tiny God seeds, he just knew they were going to bring the best out of him in the long run. He just knew it. The parable of Jesus. Jesus said, here's the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. It's the message about the kingdom of God. And those along the path, they are the ones that hear it. And then the devil comes and snatches away the word from their hearts. Those on the rocky ground, they are the ones who hear the word and they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they only last a short time. They believe for a while, but when trouble, persecution, testing comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seed sown among thorns, they hear the word, but as they go on their way, they're choked by the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desire for other things. They don't mature. The seed isn't fruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word. They accept it. Their thinking and their practices are challenged. They understand. They produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some even a hundred times what was sown. God is the generous farmer. He doesn't only spread the God seed, the God thoughts on the good soil. He doesn't only spread the God thoughts on the folks whose hearts are spacious. He spreads the God thoughts, the seed on the path, the people who are getting walked all over. He spreads the God thoughts on the rocky ground, the folks who get excited about everything, but they don't stick with anything. He spreads the God thoughts on the thorny ground, the people whose hearts and lives just don't have any space. Worry, anxiety, money, wealth, pleasure, legitimate concerns of all kinds, desires, just, just so many other things. God is always the one taking that initiative in seeking us, in offering these God thoughts, these planting these seeds in season after season after season of life. Always hopeful always there's a possibility and and none of us remain well like oh i'm just one kind of soil well no uh throughout the seasons of our life we have times when we're probably more like the rocky soil more like the thorny soil more like the good soil more like the path the the soils are a picture of what kind of space what kind of space 
do these God seeds have in my heart? Because we're all constantly this unique blend of uh, experiences and coping mechanisms and enthusiasm and motivations and ideas and distractions and procrastination and limitations and, and all of this stuff. And what kind of space, what's that soil like in your heart? What kind of space do the God seeds have inside of you right now? If you had to look at your heart, what kind of space do those tiny little seeds that God might say, here, here's this thought, what kind of space do they have to, to say something that could impact you more than you could imagine, to heal you? to cause you to face something that you just cannot ignore, to, to challenge the ways that you think and you live and to change you. The question is not, well, what are my circumstances right now? As if your circumstances determine your, your soil, the spaciousness of your heart. Our circumstances do not determine our, our soil quality. The question is, what is, what is this spaciousness of my heart right now? Is there room in my heart for God seeds to grow right now. Do the God seeds have room? Do they have space to bring that that otherworldly power into your life? Is your heart compressed, shallow, choked, or spacious? That's the question. Love you friends.